Our children are hungry food-wise and emotion-wise, how school wellness teams can help. For those of you who are joining us for the first time today, the California Local School Wellness Policy Collaborative is a group of representatives from school wellness-focused organizations whose purpose is to implement highly effective local school wellness policies in California schools to support student health and academic, and academic achievement. This is our first Winning at Wellness webinar this school year, and the purpose of this series is to share information and resources intended to support school partners in their school wellness at work. And as a friendly reminder, today's Winning at Wellness webinar is approved by the SP Professional Standards. And now I would like to introduce today's moderator, Nick Anisich. Nick is the Farm to School Program Manager with the California Department of Food and Agriculture. Before working for the state of California, Nick was a school garden and culinary teacher at Sacramento's Charter High School and an urban agriculture and food systems organizer at Soil Born Farms. Nick lives in Sacramento, California with his family. Without further ado, I'll hand it over to Nick who will now go over our objectives and introduce today's speakers. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. I see on the call we have 132 participants and growing and that we had over 400 people registered. So I'm really, really grateful and excited that you're all here today and that we get to talk all this stuff through. So like Jerry said, I'm Nick Anisich. I'm the Farm to School Program Manager with the California Department of Food and Ag. I'm also the co-chair of the Promote and Protect Access to Nutrition uh, Subcommittee Domain with the California Local School Wellness Policy Collaborative. So if you're interested in food security, food access, uh, expanding a school's role uh, to, to support nutrition, please reach out. I'll put my info in the chat uh, today too, so you can dive deeper. Um, in today's webinar, we have three main objectives. So here they are, I'm gonna read them for you. Explain the connection between school nutrition, social emotional learning, and the social emotional climate. Identify policy systems and environmental strategies to support the social emotional learning climate through school nutrition and nutrition ed. And then identify how overlapping social emotional learning and nutrition education support school wellness goals. So I'm really excited for this conversation. And if you're thinking to yourself, why does someone from the Department of Food and Agriculture care so much about social emotional learning and uh, cafeteria climate is because we really believe at the agency and all of us probably here on this call that schools can play a larger role in the food system. When most people think of schools, they think of playgrounds, cafeterias, and maybe the school pickup line if you're a parent or the drop-off line. But the cafeteria, like the kitchen of your home, it can be the heart, the heartbeat of a school community and a school campus, a place where families and kids and everyone can come together to learn and grow and eat and feel safe and secure. So what we try to do at the Department of Food and Ag through our California Farm to School Grant and through, um, <clears throat> excuse me, and through our partnership with the Dairy Council of California is provide resources, expertise and assistance to anyone who's trying to expand the role of a school cafeteria to provide more nutrition, more opportunities for engagement, more of that holistic care. We wanna share resources and expertise and just give you the help that you need and ask for. So I'm really excited today to be diving deeper into these issues, to hear directly from Bailey and Melissa, our two speakers, about how to turn your school wellness policy from paper into practice and how to bring this heart back to, the, back to schools. So I'm really grateful for everyone here today. And um, if we go to the next slide, I'll hand it to Bailey who's the Community Nutrition Advisor for the Dairy Council of California. And then Bailey's gonna hand it to Melissa. And like I said, these two are incredibly inspiring, so many great resources and uh, in so much great information to share. Please throughout the presentation, use the chat to ask questions. I'll be moderating the Q&A at the end. So please take it away, Bailey. Thank you everyone for coming today. Thank you, Nick. And thank you um, everyone for joining us this morning as we dive deeper into how we can support our students' social emotional learning and school climates through nutrition education. To give a very brief background, um, Dairy Council of California has been supporting community health through nutrition education for over 100 years and we remain committed to our cause to elevate the health of children and families in California through the pursuit of lifelong healthy eating habits. This past year, we launched the Let's Eat Healthy movement, 
which allows us to activate our cause and do even more. So inviting coordination, collaboration, and co-creation with organizations to ensure that all communities are supported to grow healthfully. So to get us started today, let's take a minute to warm up with a brief reflective activity. In the chat box, please share with us and describe how do you think social emotional learning and the image on the slide are connected. So this could be one word, it could be a sentence, whatever comes to your mind, please share with us in the chat. So how do you think SEL and the image of the school lunch are connected? Comfort, full tummy can learn, providing proper nourishment, eating healthy and fresh, a healthy body equals a healthy mind. I love that, Michelle. Healthy eating supports brain activity. Food is love. Nourishment. Nutrients that help a growing body and mind. Angry is a real thing, that is true. We socialize when we eat. Healthy food, a healthy student. These are some great answers. Thank you everyone for sharing in the chat. Um, we're gonna continue to answer this question throughout our time together today. So what is social emotional learning? SEL is the process in which individuals learn to interact with others, set and achieve goals, and regulate their emotions. These skills reinforce traditional academic markers of success, such as reading, writing, and mathematics. There are five core competencies, self-awareness, self-management, social awareness, relationship skills, and responsible decision-making. Developing these five competencies is critical to lifelong success. The California Department of Education continues to advance SEL in partnership with leaders, policymakers, children and families. CDE's multi-tiered system of support or the MTSS framework places SEL as a key element of a fully integrated system of support for the benefit of all students. This is because social, emotional and physical well-being are all very connected. Social school climate and social emotional learning have often been treated separately but both are necessary to build healthy schools. They are co-influential and they benefit each other. The multi-tiered systems of support, MTSS, and the WISC framework, the whole school, whole community, whole child, show how multiple aspects of the school environment support students' health, well-being, and academic success, including the school nutrition environment. The goal of SEL programs are to nurture student skills that provide opportunities for development in everyday situations. Often SEL programs have been confined to teaching these skills through designated lessons in the classroom, and they have yet to be fully integrated into the daily lives of students. So integrating these experiences throughout the school day builds a positive social emotional climate and increases opportunities for our students to practice SEL as a life skill. SEL and all learning really do start with nutrition security. High quality and nutritious foods are an essential part of ensuring children are supported to grow healthfully, learn optimally, and develop social emotional well being throughout life. School meals improve access to nutrient dense foods that are based on the dietary guidelines for Americans and designed to increase consumption of key food groups such as fruits, vegetables, dairy, and whole grains, closing those nutrient gaps that exist for many children in the U.S. And for some children, school meals may be the most nutritious meal that they will receive in their day. There are key nutrients necessary to support cognitive and neurodevelopment, particularly during infancy and early childhood. School-age children also need a wide variety of nutrient-dense foods to meet their growth needs. The research continues to show that eating school meals every day is associated with healthier dietary intakes among school children 
providing a foundation for supporting cognitive development and the way that children feel throughout the day. This plays a role in stabilizing mood, self-esteem and focus, ensuring that all children are receptive to all learning, including SEL. So, you know, in short, nutrition is foundational and it's essential for student success, but it takes more than providing access to food alone. Kids need to eat the nutritious food provided and a positive social and emotional school climate that includes nutrition can support that. School cafeterias are particularly important in shaping school climate as they offer a daily opportunity to interact with less supervision than is experienced in a classroom setting. It's no secret that schools are a place of learning, reading, hearing, seeing. They're all methods of learning, but experiential learning can have the biggest impact on our children. The Collaborative for Academic, Social, and Emotional Learning identifies how social and emotional competencies, like the five we reviewed earlier, are experienced and reinforced in the cafeteria. So for example, children develop the ability to manage their emotions and behavior in the cafeteria so that they can sit, they can eat, they can interact and enjoy their time with their classmates. And they repeat and practice these behaviors and these cafeteria expectations of how to be respectful and responsible. And these, these are also reinforced in the classroom throughout the school day. Universal free meals offers a unique opportunity to focus on the cafeteria and environment and attract students to enjoy school meals and reduce the stigma around consumption of those school meals. According to research done by the Urban Institute, universal free meals increases participation among students who previously received free meals. So this suggests that factors beyond the price change, perhaps stigma, influence students' decisions to participate. So as I mentioned earlier, this may be the most nutritious meal a student receives in a day. So principals, teachers, parents, and school food service staff all play a part in improving the perception of school meals and ultimately improving the social emotional climate. School food services are funded and dependent on participation, as most of you know, Right? Greater participation creates a stronger program and supports access and equity for all students. So now that we've gone over the why, why it's important to make that connection between school nutrition, SEL, and the social emotional climate, let's talk about the how. In our school communities, COVID has really highlighted the critical role that nutrition plays for their students and families. As you have seen at your school districts, many families lined up all year to drive through and pick up these much needed meals. Many families were utilizing these meals offered by school nutrition staff and the universal meals became much more widely available. Integrating SEL into the local school wellness policy is an, is an excellent strategy to reinforce the interconnection between various wellness strategies like SEL, school nutrition, and nutrition education, helping the school community see that WISC model come to life. This year, we have a strategic opportunity to update our wellness policies to reflect an ongoing commitment to universal meals. Language related to SEL can also be added to support adequate eating time, pleasant meal environment, process and requirements for nutrition education. If your wellness policy cannot be revised yet, you can still take action through the triennial assessment process to assess current progress and SEL areas and to help you set new goals. The work plan to achieve these goals could be how long students have to eat, which is critical to give our students the opportunity to socialize and connect with their peers. It can also include coming up with solutions to add grab and go point of sale, or getting students involved in the cafeteria, whether it be hanging student artwork or adding colorful posters of nutritious meals, or conducting a survey from students on how to improve the environment or the menu choices. The wellness work plan can include an assessment of the cafeteria environment, or maybe the number of teachers that are currently implementing nutrition education. 
later in our presentation, Melissa will be able to give us a few examples of what that policy looks like and her work plan and, and how it's currently working in Lawndale Elementary School District. So many of these examples shared like elevating the cafeteria environment are strategies from the Smarter Lunchrooms movement. Smarter Lunchrooms reinforce healthy eating and nudge students toward nutritious foods by using evidence-based lunchroom-focused principles to promote healthy eating. Elevating our schools with small changes like hanging colorful posters, student artwork, rearranging the food on the service line, and providing opportunities for students to learn and practice healthy eating. These small changes toward a positive social emotional climate help create a safe and supportive learning environment that can impact our students' engagement. The California Local School Wellness Policy developed a CDE approved triennial assessment template. Um, it's an easy to use four part template that provides sample language and checklists and report templates that can be adapted based on your needs. So you can use this template to compare SEL specific language in the wellness policy and to also adopt language from model policies reflected of SEL connections and nutrition, assess current progress and compliance, and taking the time to set those new goals like elevating the cafeteria environment or increasing that nutrition ed. You can find the template um, and the resources using the link on the screen, but we'll also include that template and um, website in the follow-up from this presentation. In addition to integrating SEL and nutrition into the wellness policy, it's important to promote that connection between nutrition and SEL with the school community. So this could be done in various ways. It could be done at school meetings, whether at a wellness committee meeting, principal and teacher meetings, LCAP and school site meetings. Social media is another pathway um, to share information about SEL. We could post brief information about the benefit of school meals on social emotional learning. And also another effective strategy is to showcase appealing photos of the meals so that parents and students know what great food is being served on the menu. It's also important to make sure that we're engaging with our educators providing them with information about universal meals, giving them maybe brief talking points about the meals um, or some fun nutrition facts that they can include in their morning announcements. The nutrition environment itself offers another opportunity to strengthen the connection between nutrition and SEL. Eating is a learned behavior and such children need many and varied exposures to food throughout their development Starting early and, of course, often is best. School food, you know, isn't like it used to be. I'm sure many of you can even think back to when you started working in school food service. We have definitely come a long way from our farm to school programs and diverse venues. We've brought about some really big changes in California. So tasting opportunities are a chance to talk food up, engage in nutrition, and decrease the stigma around school food through normalization and conversation. So getting students involved in the cafeteria, whether it's volunteering or providing feedback on menu options, students feel a sense of ownership and it'll improve how the students perceive the food offered. Ensuring that children have access to healthy food is just one piece of the puzzle. They also need to be taught about nutrition and how food fuels their bodies, enabling them to bake that connection between the food they eat and health. So teaching nutrition education at school, students are given the knowledge and tools that they need to establish lifelong healthy eating habits. Children can establish a foundation for nutrition alongside other subjects, learning about different food groups and nutrition topics while reinforcing social and emotional intelligence and decision-making. The Center for Disease Control recommends 40 to 50 hours of nutrition education a year to affect behavior change, while most students receive less than eight hours of nutrition education a year. I understand that there are many barriers that play a role here, primarily due to lack of time or competing academic priorities. You know, we simply cannot expect teachers to do everything. So to overcome these barriers, Nutrition education needs to be part of the larger systems approach 
to the WISC framework to support both healthy eating and SEL core competencies. So what does that look like? So thinking from that lens of the WISC model, there are so many different pathways and environments that we can teach nutrition education. Thinking about the classroom, teachers can implement Nutrition Fridays and teach a lesson or activity. In the cafeteria, school food service can host a tasting of produce or a new menu item that's offered that month. Nutrition lessons can be incorporated in health classes, PE, after school programs. Schools can also host assemblies to learn about where their food comes from. Um, the Dairy Council of California recently released a Let's Eat Healthy planning calendar. You can see it here on this slide. And it provides monthly themes to get you started implementing nutrition across the school environment. You can customize the calendar, add your own themes, and really build your own plan to support student wellness. So we wanna think about that systems and processes that you can set up to ensure that wellness is embedded through various different pathways, including the cafeteria, the classroom, and other times during the school day. So I'm very excited for our next speaker, Melissa, who will be sharing with you what that looks like at the district level and how Lawndale Elementary School District is supporting the social emotional climate um, of our students. So, all right, Melissa, take it away. Hi, thank you, Bailey. Hello, everyone. My name is Melissa Gallardo, um, and my pronouns are she, her, and I am the health educator for the wellness program here at Lawndale Elementary School District. So before we get started, I just wanted to give you all um, a really brief um, background on the wellness program. So it's actually been in our district for over 20 years, and it was created to support the district's wellness policy. Um, obviously, the program has changed a lot over the last 20 years, um, especially this last year because of COVID. But um, currently, the program um, is made up of three core members. So we have our outreach coordinator, myself, the health educator, and our administrative assistant. And in addition to our core team, we also contract champion parents and teachers um, who assist us with um, program activities and helping us um, kind of spread the word and get other folks in the community involved. Um, and we also have wellness liaisons who support the wellness policy uh, specifically. Um, this additional help um, is super helpful, um, but it, their hours are also very limited since they're um, most of these people are already employees of the school district. Um, and um, kind of with that said, even though we're a fairly small group, we 100% would not be able to do all that we do if it wasn't for our uh, community support as a whole and the rest of the food services department who were actually housed under. So what we'll be discussing today, we're gonna to be going through district demographics, um, the connection between social emotional learning and the wellness policy, policy and practice, um, who makes it happen, how we fund and lessons learned and moving forward. So beginning with uh, Londa Elementary School District, um, Londa is a small lower income working class community that's located in the South Bay region of Los Angeles. Um, the median household income is lower than that of LA County and even lower than that of California. Um, and the city's demographics are pretty diverse. We have uh, the majority of residents being of Latin American descent followed by white, Asian, black, and American indigenous being the minority. Um, but when it comes to student demographics, it's really similar to that of the cities. Um, we service over 4,600 students between um, pre-K and eighth grade across eight different campuses. Um, and 90% of our students identify as black, indigenous, or, um, and or a person of color. Um, and 87% of our students are from lower income households um, and qualify for free and reduced meals. Um, and in fact, um, at least 18% of families are food insecure with um, incomes below 300% uh, of the federal poverty line. Okay, so social emo emotional learning and the wellness policy, what's the connection? So as Bailey previously mentioned, um, SEL is a process that is designed to help students understand the relationships between emotions and behaviors. Um, in relation to their own self-worth, um, academic achievement, uh, well-being, and ability to learn how to regulate and connect with others. 
um, and kind of touching on the wellness policy, although um, explicitly including SEL terminology and tenants in your um, district's wellness policy is great if you can do it. Um, it's also okay for those who can't um, kind of to be uh, fully transparent, our own wellness policy does not include SEL terminology. Um, however, um, there are um, ten or clauses in our wellness policy that do support um, kind of the general idea of what that is. So I included um, a few excerpts here. I'm not gonna go through and um, read the two bullets, um, but um, it's here for you if you wanted to review. Um, but kind of the reason why I'm skipping over it is because I do feel like um, if your wellness policy looks at the child as a whole, um, it's very likely that your wellness policy is really strong already. Um, and what's important is that your wellness policy works for you and is reflective of what your students need. Um, so once you have a wellness policy that works for you all um, and your students, um, then you can kind of get creative with the kinds of programs that you decide to implement um, and support their needs using SEL tenants and framework. Okay, so uh, free and reduced meal demographics. Um, so kind of on the note of developing activities that are reflective of students' needs, for us, um, the first step was looking at uh, nutrition security. Um, as I previously mentioned, 87% of our uh, students come from lower income households. Um, and looking at this data um, that was from 2020, 2021, um, we can see that this is reflected in that, um, just about 87% of our students qualify for free and reduced meal um, meals. Um, so yeah, um, let me go ahead and... And so one of the reasons why also I wanted to include this and also um, begin with looking at food security is because we know that um, in order to build a program that supports SEL and the tenets of self-awareness, uh, self-management, social awareness, relationship skills, and responsible decision-making, um, we need to make sure that our students have the most basic necessities met, um, one of which is you know, the energy to learn and, and to thrive in schools. Okay, so policy and practice, um, reducing hunger. Um, so how this looks like for us at Lonsdale, we have four different programs that support student access to nutritious foods. The first being provision two, which is how we've been able to provide universal free meals. Um, the program was established um, by the food services department in 2018, 2019 school year. Um, and this program allowed us um, to offer and for all students to receive um, meals that are either no cost, um, that are no cost for, um, for all families, regardless of their income. Um, and as I'm sure um, you've heard in the past, and I believe also Bailey mentioned, one of the um, uh, one of the benefits um, aside from reducing stigma is also reducing application and paperwork burden for both of our families and our staffs, which has been huge and um, has also encouraged um, students and their families to enroll in this. Um, well, since they don't have to enroll. <laughs> um, and so we also do find that um, it really does remove the stigma with when it comes to um, school meals, um, which has been a huge help for us when it comes to our one of our other programs, Share Tables, which I'll talk about um, just in a bit. Um, so our next program is Produce Pickups. Um, for this activity, we partner with um, a local food rescue organization. And this, um, this partnership allows us to offer 18 produce pickups per year. Um, so families are able to receive a variety of uh, free, fresh fruits and veggies. Um, and kind of wanted to say that also in this last year alone, um, we were able to distribute over 50,000 pounds of produce, which has been huge um, for us um, in our efforts to combat hunger and food waste in our communities. And I also lumped under uh, produce pickups are our garden farm stands. So each of our um, campuses here at Lawndale has a, um, a community garden where students can participate in growing uh, fresh fruits and veggies. Um, and so the, some of the produce that's grown um, either goes to farm stands, which are essentially like mini farmers market booths where families are able to come pick up. Um, and if not, we're also able to send um, some of that produce to the lunch line so that um, students have kind of that garden to fork experience. And then getting to share tables. Um, so share tables was established in 2017 to address uh, student hunger and food waste. 
Um, and the premise of this program is that students place items that they're not planning on eating um, into respective bins and students who are hungry can grab what they'd like. Um, so this is also kind of teaching students to honor their hunger cues and um, knowing if they're not hungry, it's okay and um, somebody else will take it and um, still being hungry, that's also okay. Um, and so items that are left over are, um, and that are still in the bins by the end of lunch are either um, distributed during um, different breaks. So like say an afternoon recess or if not at dismissal so students can take home and, and have us as a snack there. Um, and the wellness program is responsible for providing materials such as the bins, ice packs and carts that the bins go on top of. Um, and we're also responsible for training school site staff, but school site staff and students are the ones who are actually running the program on a day-to-day. -day. Um, so this is really good um, in fostering that um, school climate and also you know, reducing the burden on the wellness program. So it's, it becomes more of a collaborative activity and um, really helps when it comes to sustainability. Um, and however, right now, unfortunately, our program is on pause because of COVID um, safety precautions, um, but we're hoping to be able to re-implement this um, soon. Okay, so policy and practice, um, youth engagement and supportive school climate. So as was mentioned prior, SEL has traditionally been um, exclusively in classrooms, but we know that in order for our LCL to become uh, a lifestyle, it needs to be inter re, um, integrated into the school day and throughout the campus. Um, so these are some of the programs that we have that um, kind of help to um, get that integration and, and be um, an everyday thing for students. Um, so the first program I wanted to mention is our Water Access and Appeal. Um, Water Access and Appeal is a project that we're working on with a group of our eighth graders um, in which um, they develop a campaign on campus to promote um, water um, access and consumption amongst their peers. Um, and the project utilizes a uh, youth-led participatory ac action research, otherwise known as YPAR framework. Um, and this framework is really um, like SEL's counterpart in that it encourages students to hone their self-awareness, um, awareness, self-management, social awareness, relationship skills, and responsible decision-making. Next, we have um, Smarter Lunchrooms Movement which encourages students to have a variety of foods and also um, increases student buy-in when it comes to picking nutritious choices on the lunch line. Um, so there are a number of strategies that support SEL, but a few of them that I wanted to highlight um, are having students create um, artwork or marketing materials for menu items, um, and then also um, encouraging them to uh, brand the lunchroom so that it reflects them and, and their peers. Um, and also having them involved in providing feedback to inform menu development. So we know that if we get students involved in the lunchroom or menu development, um, this increases the likelihood that um, they're going to be expanding what they accept now and in the future. And then so lastly, we also have um, nutrition education. And when it comes to nutrition ed, we offer classes um, both in the classroom and outside of the classroom in our school gardens. Um, and when it comes to the school gardens, we have two garden educators, um, which are super awesome, and they um, take the lead on, on those classes. One of them um, is actually through a partnership with Food Corp. Um, and then, um, but both of the garden educators provide various classes. Um, some of the classes are a little bit more traditional um, where th there's like lessons planned and other classes are, um, as you can see in the picture here, um, more hands-on and we're getting kids uh, and their hands into the dirt and learning um, the process of growing food. Um, and when it comes to the classes in the, the, the lessons that are in the classrooms, um, we offer classes for both students and parents. Um, and in the past, um, the, these classes were conducted by members of the wellness program, um, but with the current grant that we have, we actually have uh, community partners right now which take the lead on these. Okay, so who makes it happen? This is a big one. Um, so I wanted to share the African pro proverb that it takes a village to raise a child. And this is another message that I really wanted to drive home because we know that uh, community collaboration is super important um, because at the end of the day, we're all here to support student development. 
So it only makes sense that we work together, right? Um, there's kind of no point in doing double work when there are people that are already on your team. So instead of seeing this part as kind of a means to an end, I really encourage you all to focus on building meaningful relationships within school and even um, within the surrounding community, um, because these are uh, the people that are going to help you build something that's sustainable. Um, and even better, um, it's also a great way to model SEL to students, because we know that one of the tenants is um, when it comes to relationship skills and social management. And this focus is on building relationships, teamwork, and um, both seeking help and offering help to others. So if you're able to model this to your student, that's also a really great way to kind of help build that climate. Um, so as I previously mentioned, our core wellness staff is really limited, but there's absolutely no way we would be able to do what we do uh, for our students if it wasn't for the help of um, everybody listed here. And I'm sure I'm missing many more, but when it comes to like food service department, custodial staff, teachers, admin, parents, like they're all um, great people to have on your side when you're wanting to, you know, make this um, community shift. and how we fund. I'm sure some of you are, are curious about this one too. Um, so we receive a good portion of our, of our funding from uh, the CalFresh Healthy Living Grant, which we received from the um, LA Department of Public Health. Um, and this grant um, supports the majority of our programming and it also um, supports our staff salaries. Um, LCAP, we receive about 60,000 per school year from LCAP. Um, and this money we um, are able to put towards um, our wellness liaisons who directly support our uh, wellness policy. And we also are able to um, pretty much keep our, our gardens sustained um, in terms of uh, the supplies that the gardens need, the supplies that our um, garden educators need, um, and even helping to pay for some of their salaries. Um, we also, I wanted to mention food services. Um, we receive indirect funding via the funding that food services um, receive. So if I know we're lucky that we're lumped under food services, but if you're not, um, it's definitely worth putting in the time and effort to really build that relationship with them. Um, so kind of some examples is uh, they've received grants um, such as No Kid Hungry and Gen Youth. Um, and the example I wanted to offer of how that has benefited the wellness program and wellness activities is that we're like, we're able to use the equipment that they have. So we're able to offer taste tests, harvest of the month, um, different activities. Um, and then the food that they purchase then later goes in to support our shared tables. Um, and then another huge one that I wanted to mention is second chance breakfast, um, which has helped us um, in addressing student hunger so that they can focus on learning and growing and, um, and not really having to focus on when they're gonna eat next. And then lastly, I wanted to mention community partnerships. Um, and this is a tremendous help because in reality, most of the, what you're spending is time fostering those relationships. Because if somebody is already doing what you want, um, you know, build those relationships. Um, if there's someone out there, um, partner with them. Like you don't have to reinvent the wheel when it comes to um, the activities and the programming that you do. Um, do you, you know, if you find people that are like-minded, um, it's gonna be easy to have something that is sustainable or easier, um, I should say. <laughs> um, and then also one of the examples that I wanted to give. Um, so one of our partners, um, Social Justice Learning Institute, we partner with them for our produce pickups. Um, so if it wasn't for organizations like them, like we wouldn't be able to offer um, bags and bags of produce to families um, throughout the year. Okay, so lessons learned and moving forward. Um, these are some of the takeaways that I wanted to leave you all with. So the first one is to don't try to reinvent the wheel, leverage what you have and what is in the community. Um, and kind of another example of this is say, if you are, um, I know Bailey mentioned that the ideal would be 40, 40 hours of nutrition ed. Um, and I know that if you're starting out or if you're anything like us, staffing is a little bit of a problem right now. Um, so just leverage was out there. Um, one example is the Dairy Council. Let's Eat Healthy has a wealth of resources on their website that are free um, that you can access. And even if you don't have time to uh, do full on lessons with students, you can take some of uh, like these free resources like nutrition ed booklets and just send them home with the kids. That's a really great way to start. Um, the next one is building and nurturing community partnerships. 
Um, this takes time, but it's absolutely essential. You wanna make sure that you have people that um, understand your vision and share this vision because you wanna build something that is gonna be sustained and be there even after you're gone. Um, and then the next one is you don't have to do it all at once. Um, like I mentioned, we've been around for 20 years and um, we do what we do because it, it's taken time and practice. And um, so you're just kind of looking to see what works for you. F pick one thing if you're barely starting out um, and kind of work to make that something that you know can be sustained and then move on to the next project. And then lastly, there's gonna be hiccups, um, as I'm sure we all know and have learned within these last two years, but the number one thing is to keep moving forward. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and hand it back to Nick. Thank you so much, Melissa and Bailey for sharing all of these great resources. Uh, please, everyone, I see there's one question already in the chat, but if you have other questions, please throw them in the chat now. And um, I'm going to moderate a Q&A discussion for us. So uh, Melissa and Bailey, the first question we had in the chat came from Susan. And it's that, are there, is there any information on high school specific level nutrition education activities? Um, do you have anything, Melissa, at the high school level? Or I know Bailey does. I can let Bailey take it. We go up to middle school, um, but I do know that the Let's Eat Healthy <laughs> does have a, a variety of um, grade levels. Okay, perfect. All right, Bailey. Thanks, Nick. I'm so happy to see that. We have a few people interested in the chat about high school resources, which is great. Yes, the Dairy Council of California does have um, three different options available for teens. Um, all of our resources are free and align with the dietary guidelines for Americans and align with the five food group focus with my plate. So the first thing I would recommend is our online Let's Eat Healthy Teen program. Um, you may have heard of it before, it was formerly Eat, Move, Win. It's an online four lesson program. It's exclusively online and it's Google friendly. It also comes with an educator guide and it can help teachers with that implementation process. And we have tutorials of how to embed it into Google Classroom to make sure that it's really easy for you and your students to use. We also have a booklet that's available for teens. It's called Activity and Eating for Teens. This is geared towards like a one-time activity. It is print. We have it in English and Spanish. So that's an option for you if you wanted to do a one-time lesson or provide that as a handout. And finally, we also have um, a wellness prescription pad for teens. It's a kind of friendly um, care pad that has suggestions um, for teens to kind of improve their healthy eating and physical activity behaviors. These are really um, popular in the health professional setting. So I'll go ahead and put the link in the chat to our team's resources, but you can also email me if you're interested in any of the resources and we can get them to you for free. Rad, thank you, Bailey. I can't tell you that how excited I am to see all these people's names in the chat of like some of my favorite people. <laughs> It's so cool to see so many people here. So thank you, everyone. All right. Um, I have a couple questions that I want to make sure we get to. And then as more come into the chat, we have time for those too. So I see yours, Janelle. Um, all right. So my first question uh, for our presenters is, what advice do you have for a school district without a wellness program? I can take that one, Nick. Um, so for... What advice um, we have for school districts that might not have a wellness program? Kind of going back to the takeaways that I had mentioned, um, it's really important to do, um, to get to know what resources are in your community um, and to focus on building those community partnerships. Um, Cause kind of going back, like even if you do have a wellness program that's established, um, you don't want to spend extra time like reinventing a wheel when, there are already people that are doing what you're doing. Um, so really hone in on, on those resources that you might have. It might take a little time to do the research, but um, there are a lot of great resources out there that are free. Um, and then also if, you, if it's like a staffing thing, um, look to see who is involved in drafting the wellness policy. It's very likely that you have kind of your own version of a wellness liaison um, and get 
get them involved, um, even if it's just one person or even um, partner with the PTA in your school um, and kind of going back to you don't have to do it all at once, um, even if it's just like maybe hosting a nutrition night, um, kind of going back to plugging that calendar that Bailey shared, um, you could pick a random day if you're not sure um, exactly what to do um, and kind of look to see um, what themes are going on in the month, um, kind of take it away from that way um, from there. Um, so yeah, so my advice would be start small, knowing that you don't have to do it all at once. And um, even if it's just sending uh, flyers home with kids once a month or, or education booklets, that's a really great place to start. Rad, I love that. Thank you, Melissa. Okay, and now to Janelle's question in the chat. How are nutrition lessons promoted? Are they mandatory in the district or written in the wellness policy? And then Janelle's also curious, of course, on the five to six lessons given at Lawndale. Uh, hi, Janelle. <laughs> yeah, so the kind of going to the lesson specifically, we use Cal Fresh curriculum. Um, they have kind of similar to um, the dairy councils um, where it's kind of laid out so that you're able to do either series or singular lessons. Um, so I would recommend also checking them out. They're a great resource. Um, and when it comes to promotion, um, it's really, we try and utilize everything that we can. So everything from uh, sending out emails to teachers, posting on social media at our produce pickup uh, events, we'll definitely plug um, or send uh, home flyers there. Um, and also we utilize something called Class Dojo. So it's, I know everybody has like their own version, but um, all families are able to um, access that. And that's a big way that we send out um, information and are able to advertise. Brad. Okay, here's a question from Pamela in the chat. How are you able to navigate practices that are designed to prevent COVID and still get teachers and principals interested in nutrition ed? It's really hard. There's a lot of different hurdles there. <laughs> And then uh, she says, currently teachers' priorities are to catch students up on basics like math. Are there any strategies available to work nutrition ed into the classroom agenda? Um, I, could, I could answer this one too. <laughs> yeah, try it. And then um, Bailey, if you have more to add in, you can try to. Perfect. Um, so honestly, it's been hard. Um, like I've mentioned some of our other like shared tables, for example, is on hold right now, it's just because of like COVID and it's even harder. Um, that's one of the, the hiccups that we found this year with students coming back is that um, it, it's, it's been taking us like a little more um, kind of like figuring out as we go, especially since we can't have volunteers on campus, whether it be um, parents or whoever, um, anybody like any other community members. So it's really been um, us and really relying on those like foundations and relationships that we that we built in the past. So it's also another reason why I really stress on those partnerships. Um, because even though it's hard, like you'll have already identified people that might be willing to take on that extra um, that extra work and it is it is like it's extra work and um, I'm sure the the stipend helps um, that we're able to provide um, but yeah it's mostly just making sure that you have those connections with teachers and and also trying to kind of tailor your programming so that it isn't as much of a burden on on other you know on teachers or other staff um, so kind of one example um, like for our nutrition ed, we have folks um, that come in to do the actual lessons so that teachers aren't having to um, add this extra plate or extra item onto their plate. Um, also consider using pre-recorded lessons. There's like a, like a myriad of recorded lessons out there, especially after the pen, like these last two years that were essentially virtual, everybody was doing recordings. Um, so looking to see how, um, even if it's just a five minute plug um, to have kids watch it that way, that's been helpful. Um, so I think that is kind of um, the two, two ways that has been helpful for us. Love it. Bailey, do you have other things to add on that, different solutions you've heard? I also encourage anyone in the chat who's listening, I know we have a bunch of directors out there and nutrition educators, like if you have answer to, answers to these two, you know, please share them in the chat. This is a collaborative shared learning space. So you can use them there too. Don't feel like your questions or anything will get buried. Bailey, have you heard anything 
about uh, getting teachers to welcome nutrition ed into their classrooms? Yeah, I just wanted to add that, you know, there's a big focus on common core and those state standards and really implementing those 21st century skills. And you can use nutrition education to do that. You know, our nutrition education lessons aligned with the common core state standards. So you can work on, you know, collaboration and creativity and those critical thinking and problem solving skills by doing nutrition education lessons in the classroom. So there is a way to sort of layer that and practice those skills that the teachers are focused on by using nutrition um, to do so. So, um, and if you, you know, do have more questions about that, I'm happy to talk offline about what that would look like. Love that, that's super nice. And I think it's so important to show that like nutrition ed isn't a separate thing. <laughs> you know, you, I, as a former school garden and culinary teacher, like you can make anything connect to anything if you really want to. <laughs> Uh, exactly. You know, we're, measure, we're doing geometry, measuring school garden boxes, or, um, you know, I don't know, like do we were doing flower petals in art class, you know, so there's so many things you could do in there. And I see Bobby put Ag in the Classroom as a resource for uh, additional recorded nutrition ed lessons. So we're excited about that. Um, Nick, sorry. Kathy I also shared Breakfast in the Classroom. Another great opportunity. Thanks, yeah. Kathy. Melissa, go, yeah. Yeah, sorry. Um, I also wanted to plug, um, there is another organization um, that we have been talking with um, that I just wanted to share in case any of you all are interested. Um, they're called Brighter Bites. Um, so we were in the process of seeing if, Nick, you've heard of them? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, we're trying to figure out logistics on our end. It's just a little hard since we aren't um, allowed to have um, folks that are outside of the district come on. Um, but if you all are or are able to get clearance, um, they are an org that provides um, produce for produce dis distribution. So they're able to do, I believe, 18 per year per school site. Um, so however many school sites you all have. And then they, I know that they also have um, a nutrition ed component. So they could either come in to do the nutrition ed for you, or they also have pre-recorded stuff that they can send. Um, so they're a really dope organization. And if you all have the capacity to, I would recommend looking them up too. Thank you. There's so many, honestly, there's a giant list. So at CDFA, we run the California Farm to School Network and have a number of resources too, but we're kind of the same way where it's like, there's so many directions you could go that, you know, reach out to myself or Bailey or Melissa, and we can make sure that you're getting the resources question, you know, that you need specifically for your community, because they're all different. Uh, Eric said, can you repeat the name of the produce organization? It's Brighter Bites, right? Yeah, Brighter Bites. Uh, as Bailey said, the recording is going out. Um, let's see, Pamela, please share the link to that video with us when it's done. Uh, where your high school kids are doing it. I think that's a great example of peer-to-peer -peer learning, empowering students with nutrition ed. So that's really, really cool to see. And I know that also a lot of districts might, uh, it might feel weird to make this connection, but Future Farmers of America does tons of peer-to-peer -peer learning. They also can have, they have resources related to nutrition ed. So if you have a Future Farmers of America program, you can reach out to us at CDFA and we can help share some best practices and examples of, um, of ag programs empowering students to teach nutrition ed, you know, high school grade to younger grades and, and all of that. I see a couple questions on here too about CDE and state level programs. I think we're gonna have to follow up with you on those ones. I don't have those specific answers um, on what's going on there. Okay, so it's 10.57. I think we have time for maybe one more question if anyone has one burning. Otherwise, I wanna make sure you get the information needed for our next webinar. I'm honestly amazed, uh, 154 participants. So not only did people stay on the call, the call grew uh, over this time, which I think uh, says a lot about the resources Melissa and Bailey were sharing, so. Okay, well, thank you everyone. So uh, Jerry, or Melissa, I think has the slides. If you could go to the next one, I wanna make sure everyone gets um, the save the date for the next webinar. 
So the next one is going to be January 18th, 2022. Yes, already 2022. I know you're all working on budgets and everything for the future school year, so you're not intimidated looking at that uh, number. But we're really, really grateful for all of you for joining today. Please remember that uh, this is a collaborative, a community, a place where you can ask questions and learn from each other, learn from people in your same role. It's not just about us shouting information at you for an hour. So please get engaged, you know, email us with your questions. All of our information is up there on that slide. Uh, signing up for our newsletter is also a great way to um, just stay in the loop if you can't make it to every webinar. So thank you everyone for joining and thank you especially to Bailey and Melissa and Jerry for setting up this webinar, for sharing all of these great resources and making this an inclusive, comfortable, safe place to ask questions and learn and grow. So thank you everyone for joining today. And uh, I hope to see you again on January 18th.